All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about hacking smart safes today. Um, I've, I've said the words um, safe hacking before. And people are always like, "What are you? What are you talking about? Are you talking yeah. about like practicing safe hacking?" Or <laughs> I'm not sure what that yeah. means. So not related to that whatsoever. Yeah, these are physical safes that have smart devices on them. Yep. Um, so yeah, really quick, just as a matter of introduction, um, I'm Dan Petro. This is uh, Oscar Salazar. We're both um, uh, associates. Uh, Oscar's a senior associate um, at Bishop Fox. We do pen testing for a number of things. Um, these sorts of Internet of Things devices included. Um, so I guess without further ado, we can get into the meat of the talk. Um, so this is the um, CompuSafe Galileo as a particular brand of um, smart safe um, that uh, we uh, happen to come across. So I want to kind of start this off with an apology, I guess. We tried really, really hard to get one of these things here on stage at DEF CON. Um, but the thing is a tank and just logistically would not have worked out whatsoever. It's 380 pounds. It's actually not that big. Um, it's only like maybe three feet tall or something like that. So for 380 pounds for such a small object, like it's just it's completely immense. You cannot lift it, basically. You have to like roll it around. And these things don't have uh, ramps, if you notice, like these stages. It was going to cost like $400 from the labor union to carry it onto the stage, and then another $400 to carry it off. Um, not to mention like shipping costs. and It was a complete nightmare, and we eventually had to give up on it. So just really sorry. We wanted to have one here on stage, but it was not in the cards. Um, so that kind of tells you a little bit about like what this safe is. Um, just like it could legitimately stand a bomb blast. The thing is a tank. Yeah, and, and essentially this thing handles money, right? Uh, you put money into the slot reader, uh, the, the money uh, dispenser things at the top. It, it's like a reverse ATM, essentially. You put money in, uh, the money then is no longer um, yours. You don't, you don't own that money. It goes, actually gets deposited into your bank account. Yep. Um, and so because of that process, the, the safe itself can't be opened by the managers. So it has a, a set of like authentication and authorization where a manager can have you know create new users and employees can put money in. But this is meant to be kind of in um, retail stores. Yeah. So it's not meant to be something that you as a consumer would have in your house, right? It's like a cash management solution meant for business, like retail outlets, right? So this would be something that would be sitting underneath the cash register, like at stores you probably go to. Um, like they're out there in the wild, right? And so this would be something that would take money from the till like after um, like an employee has too much money rather than leaving in the till or having them count it in a way that could have lots of accounting problems. Um, you like insert the money into the safe and then it can uh, wait there until like the carrier service um, actually carries it away. Right, and so the, the carrier service essentially will come and pick up the money at a, some either designated amount of time or when the safe reaches a certain amount of money and uh, they'll take it away. And in order for them to take the money out of the safe, it requires uh, both the manager and the carrier service, like the armored car service, to uh, both uh, sign into the yeah. application. That's an important um, point to mention, is that because the money um, for the safe um, is deposited into the store's account once money is inserted into it. That informs um, two things. One, it informs the security model behind the safe. So like as Oscar said, um, the store manager is not actually allowed to open the top drawer of the safe where the cash is because the cash is no longer his money. Right? Once the cash is inside that safe, it's already deposited into the bank's account. That's the bank's money just temporarily sitting around inside of that safe. Um, so the way that the security model um, is worked out is it's like, like a nuclear launch facility, which is what we have like here. right? So like two people have to simultaneously put in their keys and turn them right. So both the carrier service have to authenticate to the safe. They have to like type in their code. Or in practice, they have like this little touch memory thing that we'll talk about. And then in addition to that, the store manager also has to put in their code. Um, so yeah, you can talk yeah, about that. So uh, we did this assessment as part of um, uh, essentially a customer came to us. They had a point of sale system that they wanted us to review. And this safe was part of that point of sale system. Um, we worked with the vendors to disclose the, um, the vulnerability, and uh, Brinks has informed us that they um, are in the process of releasing a patch. And um, we ha actually tested uh, a patch that uh, Fire King created that fixes one of the specific issues that was used to create this, this uh, attack chain. <clears throat> yeah, uh, let's see. Also, um, uh, so we have uh, a safe that we um, had purchased off of eBay um, uh, with remarkably no questions asked. 
Um, and uh, that was the one that we were trying to, uh, to bring here in person. I guess there's another little anecdote to share with you about like, just how like, kind of crazy and massive the thing is. So we um, got this thing um, shipped. It has to ship via freight. And it gets to our office over at Bishop Fox, right? And I'm like all super happy. I'm like, finally, the, the safe is here. I'm going like, to get to mess with it. Um, and like, a dude comes around the side and says, like, okay, like, we've got this big like, package for you. Go ahead and bring around your forklift and bring it off the truck. I'm like, a oh, foot. A forklift? I don't have a goddamn forklift. Like, why would you expect that I have a forklift? I didn't expect to need a forklift. So we had to, like, schedule a completely different truck that has, like, a pneumatic lift to come by, and it was a complete nightmare. Even just, like, getting it, like, 10 feet from the truck, like, into our office. Um, so, like, nothing about this has been easy, basically. Yeah, and so... We're kind of disclosing all this information for you know educational purposes, informational purposes only. Don't try this at home. This is you know definitely don't try this at your neighbor's home. Yeah, you can try it in your own home if you own your own safe, maybe. Um, all right, so we're actually gonna go ahead and do a demonstration. I'll let. Yeah. This is where we hope we have audio. We don't. Let's see. It, I'm definitely plugged in, so let's see if we can get audio. I hear it now. Okay. Let's play this and see if we don't blow everyone's ears out. I think that's a reasonable level. Traditional safes, like just about everything nowadays, have technologically evolved into computerized smart safes, which are currently being used by countless businesses across the country. A safe, by definition, is inherently safe. People trust them with their most valuable possessions, and businesses trust them with cash, large amounts of cash. You would think that smart safes are even more trustworthy and secure than the old-fashioned kind, right? But how smart are they really? For the most part, smart safes seem pretty secure. However, one particular model has a serious design flaw. The Brinks CompuSafe Galileo has a USB port on the safe's exterior. This enables a malicious user to automate an attack on the safe's computer and quickly opens its doors. All someone needs to do is plug a program thumb drive into that port and voila. To learn more, visit our website at www.bishopfox.com. Yeah. Um, so that, that was, uh, was that an awesome video? That's totally on our YouTube channel. Um, some company named uh, Gravic or Gravoc, I'm not sure exactly how to say it, um, made that. They do like graphic design and infosec. Like, seriously, that was awesome. Yeah. So yeah, the shout outs to those guys. They made this like sweet cartoon and everything for it. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, we, uh, that goes really quickly through some of the like major vulnerabilities um, that we identified with the safe. Um, we're going to talk individually about like every single step along that line. If you freeze frame like through that video, you can kind of see the, uh, the exploit chain as it were. Um, but uh, we'll go uh, through a bit more depth here. Yeah, um, and so what we want to talk about a little bit is how this is actually a culmination of a bunch of different issues. This is kind of a long attack chain that ends with the safe opening. Um, but each individual piece by itself doesn't lead to a full compromise. Uh, so this is kind of um, hardware, software, configurations, networking, all of those things kind of are required in order to uh, yeah. perform this type of exploit. Yeah. I think that's um, maybe even something worth mentioning in terms of like the uh, internet of things, right? Where like these are all areas that we as like hackers are used to, right? These are the issues that we're used to dealing with. But now that you have these like uh, other devices that are coming out, right, with people that are very used to making toasters, right, and they're not used to making toasters that are secure against attacks like over the internet, um, that these are all issues that are going to be coming up in every day devices that like we didn't used to have to care about. Um, so like all these sorts of issues, like it may seem obvious and almost like laughable to us, right, but like keep in mind that like these are sort of issues that are going to be coming forward um, more often. Yeah, and these are the types of things that we see kind of across all types of internet of things devices, right? We recently yeah. saw the news about um, the cars that can be hacked. Right? That's something that was a space before that yeah. never, never had to worry about security in that fashion uh, other than a car alarm. And now you have to protect against um, hacks and attacks against right. uh, your And smart obviously, you know, big whiz bang objects like cars and airplanes get a lot of press, and maybe they should, right? But like everyday objects, right, and things implanted inside of businesses and homes also need a lot of attention as well. 
So yeah, uh, this is a picture of the outside of the safe. So um, the front panel has like a touch screen, and so this is on the left panel uh, of that touch screen. Um, the way that um, the uh, service uh, pickups um, authenticate to it, like to say like, you are going to be like you know picking up cash, you have this little contact memory key. Um, I actually had no idea what this even was until I had to Google it because I was like wondering what on earth this connector was, and like it's uh, this like magnetic thing that maybe talks over some cryptographic protocol or maybe something. Like that, and that's how like the, um, uh, the the drivers basically authenticate to the safe to say, "Hey, I'm here to pick up cash." Yeah, um, I really wish we were up here talking about how we reverse engineered some really cool thing, and like we were doing stuff about this with this contact key. But that's not really what this talk is about. Um, this talks about the exposed USB port uh, on the side of the safe, right next to it. Immediately right next to it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that port is not like. It's not behind a panel of some kind. It's not like hidden underneath something. You don't need to like room open the door to get to it. It's just right on the side of the safe. Yeah. Um, so having an exposed USB is a, a pretty big deal in terms of being able to plug into the device. We we you know we saw this. We immediately plugged in a, a mouse and we saw a cursor uh, pop up on the screen. And we're like, all right. Yeah. I, I like where this is going. Yeah. Um, Immediately liked where that was going. Yeah, um, and so we're like, okay, so we, you know, we're we're plugging in a, a mouse, we're moving it around, we're plugging in, a, like unplugging that, we're plugging in the keyboard, we're like typing some stuff, and we're like unplugging that, plugging in the mouse again, and it starts getting quite cumbersome. So we make like a quick trip. We're like, okay, we we got to solve this problem, and so we go to Best, Best Buy. Buy and we buy a USB dongle or like a like a hub, hub, yeah, that allows us to connect multiple devices. We're like, a problem solved. Yep, great news. And so <laughs> we plug that in and start working. Uh, our way through. Um, shortly afterwards, we actually remove the four Phillips head screws from the side of the display. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is the the front panel, the entire touch screen, just unhinges and moves forward. Um, yeah, there's just four Phillips head screws, um, not like security screws. They're not like epoxied in. Um, it's not like behind. They just regular Phillips head screws unhinge the whole thing, and you can get access to some computer innards there as well. Yeah, so this is actually a, a picture from the top down. And they also had the same epiphany as we did. They bought a USB hub and Velcroed it into the inside of the safe yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's literally Velcroed in. So yeah, those, those I think this is almost like a microcosm of what happened with like the safe, right? Like, I, I have this mental picture in my head of like the safe being designed and manufactured, and then come time where like somebody's putting it all together, they go like, "Oh shit, we needed two USB ports in the front, and we only ran one in." They're like, "Well, shit, uh, run out to Best Buy, <laughs> Velcro in a USB hub, and just call it a day." Um, and so. So uh, this is actually really important because uh, the touch screen itself is a, just a USB HID device, right? It's just like a touch, that's what it is. So um, the fact that like you can unhinge this and just get direct access to that USB is really important because that's like built into the design of the safe, right? It's not like you can just easily remove that because there has to be a USB port leading out to this front panel. And if you can just unhinge the front panel and get access to that USB, then that's like um, good hardware um, access right there. Um, that one's not showing up. The uh, even more slightly uh, less uh, exposed USB port. So that on the back of the safe, so like in the complete rear of it, um, the lower left-hand corner, um, there's a little hole that has like an Ethernet jack coming out, um, serial port, um, and uh, another USB port. Um, this one is like so. This is the third USB port basically coming out of the side of the safe. Though this one is less important because like it's in the back, and like these things are not meant to be easily accessed. Um, like they're bolted to the ground, so it's not like you can like pull it out to move it. It's probably in some sort of an enclosure. Yeah, I mean, if you're getting to the point where you're kind of pulling the whole safe out to connect to the USB, it's going to be pretty obvious. You're not going to be able to kind of do that in a sneaky fashion. So, yeah, not too bad. Um, right. So these USB drives had full drivers enabled. Right. This is. Uh, had the ability to plug in a, a keyboard, a mouse, it immediately recognized it. Um, we had, we were able to plug in a, a thumb drive as well to get access to storage. Yeah, USB mass storage, USB HID, um, basically full drivers enabled. There's nothing like restricted in any way. Um, there wasn't some sort of like a, you know, a USB device whitelisting or like nothing like that basically. Yeah, you, just, you just plug in and it just works. Yeah, so one of the big things is you can actually boot off of the, um, <laughs> off the USB. So at the bottom of the touch panel, there's a button 
that allows you to reboot the device. So you yeah. just press it. It's like so a big, big red, red button. Yeah. Um, right, right like underneath it. So if you're looking at the touch screen, it's just like right underneath it. Um, and as soon as you hit it, like the big Windows XP, um, like would you like to log out, reboot, or turn off, like comes up. We, right? Before we pressed it, we were like, is it, is it going to inject the money? Like what is this? Yeah, button? what does that button it's like do? A big red button it's a, at the bottom. It's unlabeled and there's just this big red button. <laughs> and didn't um, do that. So it was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so right from there, you can just reboot the machine. You don't need to like get access. You don't have to authenticate. You just touch the button. You can reboot the machine right from there. Um, and then plugging in a USB hard drive, you just boot from USB and then do whatever you want to the safe from there, basically. Um, so that's actually um, a really important attack um, combined with um, this. Yeah, and so um, the the whole database or the whole safe essentially works off of this one database, and it's an MX Access database 4.0, which is uh, yeah, a little bit. You start old. to hear rumblings to the crowd, like oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so um, it's password protected, but it's not encrypted. So if you, you yeah. know, try to access it using MS Access, then you'll get prompted with a password. It's kind of like an opt-in password policy. Yeah. Uh, if you open it on <laughs> Mac or Linux, uh, yeah. it doesn't prompt you yeah. for, for a password yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah, that's just Access's fault, basically, right? Like that's just how like the old versions work. Where like they just decide to stick a password like in plain text, the header of the file, and just like cross their fingers and hope that no one reads it. Yeah, I think um, the very very early versions had a plain text password in the header, and then they started. Kind of encoding it more and more and more. Because and so security. version 4.0, it's encoded but completely reversible yeah. as well, so you can get the plain text password yeah. out of so it. So you could just not use Windows and it just opens up the file just fine. Yeah. Um, um, so this also ha uh, handles, this database handles all the authentication and authorization. Um, it's where all of your user information is stored. Uh, it has uh, your yep. credentials in there. It stores all the logs about access to the safe. So when you go and put money in and make a deposit, and when the armored car people come and pull the money out, uh, all of that is logged into this database. So gaining access to this database is um, basically the keys to the castle, right? Once you're yep. able to access this database or modify this database, you're able to essentially open yeah. the door. So you can imagine uh, a world where like a safe were designed with like a crypto chip on the inside of it like burnt into a piece of hardware that can't be like modified where it would like do some sort of uh, cryptographic uh, challenge response like protocol that way like if the computer were to be like hijacked then like you couldn't uh, man in the middle of that connection you couldn't do replay attacks or whatever and that's just not how this works. Um, and like that's just not how this works at all. There's just the, the safe is essentially a COM port attached to the uh, the XP box that's uh, beneath this thing, and just sends the like unlock command, and then just unlocks, right? So a compromise so, of the of the OS itself. Yeah. Uh, allows if you compromise the, the the OS, you compromise the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so we have a second demonstration here. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So oh, actually no, this is just a breakout. Yeah, so I'm used to the the slides. Sorry. <laughs> this is just. I'm getting ahead of myself. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, so. When we first plugged in the keyboard and mouse, right, we're in this kiosk mode for this safe. We're trying to break out of the kiosk mode. We try the regular things, right? We try like Control Shift Escape. We try um, Alt Tab. We try Alt F4. Uh, we try, you know, uh, uh, the Windows key, a couple combinations, and nothing mm -hmm. seems to work. And yeah. so, start feeling a little frustrated and decide that kind of the Hulk smash technique will work, and just start pounding on the keyboard. And highly manual, like keyboard yeah. fuzzing. Yeah, a and, technical uh, term. <laughs> and it actually works. So uh, something pops up <laughs> and uh, allows us to break out of the sandbox, and we're like, "All right, this is awesome." Um, unfortunately, the the kiosk mode on the application kind of reasserts itself every once in a while. So like push in front it's of like everything. It's like 60 seconds. It just like yeah, or, forces yeah. itself back to the foreground. So we're like halfway into breaking out of this sandbox. We've like have Explorer running already, and then everything falls behind the kiosk mode again. Like ah. Oh. <laughs> All right, and so we start trying to smash on the keyboard again. Probably look like a bunch of idiots sitting in front of the safe. Um, this is how we hack. Yeah, just like the movies. It's just like the movies. Um, and unfortunately, we like can't get it to reproduce. So we had to find a more reliable exploit. Yeah. Um, and so this is what we ended up coming up with. So the the way that this safe works is. The yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a tutorial system on the safe, right? If you want to add a user or learn how to about how to deposit money into the safe, you, there's a tutorial button. So you click on this tutorial button, it brings you to a bunch of videos that will allow you to learn how to properly operate the safe. Yeah. Um, however, they're all flash videos. So right-clicking on uh, the flash object there, 
allows you to pull up flash settings. Yeah. Uh, you go to the about configuration. Also, something me- worth mentioning while on those flash videos, um, one of the awesome things about the, they have like a, a help videos about basically to do anything with the safe, including like how to log in as a manager. Um, and uh, in the in the like how to log in as a manager um, video that's like on the safe, it says like about halfway through it, like uh, don't forget, like if you forget your password, the default is one, two, three, four, five. And I'm like, and uh, yeah. like our safe still had that um, like enabled on it, um, which was was pretty good. Though importantly, right, this is just a store manager who doesn't have access to the safe door. So even though that's there, like it doesn't really get us anything. Yeah. So once we were able to go to the um, Internet Explorer, the About Config for Adobe, uh, it pops up Internet Explorer. Because yeah. you hit About, so it tries to go to Adobe.com in Internet Explorer six. Yeah, um, and from there you're able to kind of go through the bypass, like go through the motions, right? Internet Explorer to Explorer, Explorer to let's say CMD, and you have you're running as yeah. administrator. Yeah. So, so once you get out to Internet Explorer, basically you can break out into the operating system. Yeah. It's pretty much game over from there. Um, so yeah, it is running Windows XP. Um, it's like an embedded version of XP. So at least hypothetically, um, it's getting like remote uh, backports, but like. Still, it's probably not great. Um, though it should be worth mentioning that like Windows 10 would not have saved the safe, right? Like there's there's a lot of other issues. Um, the fact that it was XP tended out not to be terribly important um, to the entire exploit chain. Um, like there could have been a lot of other like permissions, maybe like maybe the application could have been running as a lower privileged user. That way you couldn't like break out and to run other commands. But like that's not. So that was helpful, at least, right? The fact that we could just modify arbitrary things in the operating system. Yeah, um, and and so yeah. <laughs> um, opening the Internet Explorer is actually what um, Fire King did as the the patch, right, to break the exploit chain to prevent us from going through the process of escaping the kiosk right. mode. Uh, so once you have access uh, to the command line, you're able to do things like add users to the database, right? Since we have the credentials uh, for the MS Access database that are stored in the headers, um, we're able to add our own service accounts, and service accounts don't uh, have the same requirements as a manager, right? If you're yeah. a service technician and you come and you have to work on the safe, um, you're the only person that needs to yeah. be logging in. Yeah, there aren't actually any service accounts um, already enabled on safes by default, so we just have to add ourselves like two new service accounts um, into the safe. We just call them like hack one and hack two. Um, yeah, uh, curiously, you still need two service accounts, like presumably because like they don't want just one service person to be able to open up the safe, right? You need to have like two people simultaneously. Like, okay, fine. So we'll just add two accounts and then yeah. log in with both. Accounts. Which is a little strange because. Yeah. So in the you, video, you'll you, probably see that. Like it actually has to like log in with two different accounts. Yeah, if you're going to work on one of these safes, you have to add your own account anyways. So there's no reason why you couldn't add two, yeah. I guess. But um, all right, so we're gonna go play through the video of the actual uh, exploit now. Uh, we'll kind of uh, pause it every once in a while and, and describe what's going on. We need audio on the computer again if that is not already done. Let's see if that works. Sweet, it works. Yeah. Right. So, so this is the safe. Um, it's essentially we created a script um, on a Teensy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Teensy. It's I think familiar. in the printed materials we said um, USB rubber ducky. Um, it turns out that the ducky doesn't do uh, mouse movements. It's only keyboard. So we wound up having to switch away from that. So unfortunately, the like printed materials are out of date. We couldn't fix them in time. So there's no big deal. It's basically we had to switch to a, a Teensy, which is an Arduino board instead that does mouse and keyboard. So. Yeah, and so basically, the the way that this works is we wrote up a script that's a a, a macro, a blind macro essentially, right? It, it, the the code is like move to these coordinates, click, uh, move to these coordinates, right click, type in this stuff, um, and essentially created a macro that had no feedback from from the system. Um, and when we were recording this video, actually, we ran the recording software on the safe itself. Um, and it actually slowed everything down so much that we had to rewrite the whole script because all the timings were off at that point. Um, so yeah, this is essentially the way the, the breakout works. Um, went into the tutorial section. We opened up Flash. <coughs> you right click on that guy. Internet Explorer comes up. It's all running real slow because it's trying to run video capture software like from the safe as well. Yeah. So then we so open in, up a new pa- like a new page and make it the System32. Uh, directory. 
and from here we're you know we'll open up the yeah. command. So this um, is awesome, by the way. So it, uh, the Team C doesn't actually have any capability to like store files on it. So if we want to run something, we have to like open up Notepad and type out a script in VB. That's what it's doing right now, right? Yeah. So the VB script um, basically creates the new users in the database. It closes up all the applications that we're running that we use to break out of the kiosk mode. And then finally, it uh, deletes itself off the file system. So um, right after that's completed, the TNC finishes the open, like types in the passwords for the accounts that we yeah. put in. The primary thing that all this is doing basically is um, adding the VV script that um, interfaces with the MS Access database and adds two new service accounts into the back end of it. Yeah, um, and all of this is without us yeah. touching the safe. So this is plug in the TNC, walk away. And yeah. uh, 60 seconds later. Yeah, all the drivers, by the way, for like interfacing with uh, MS Access from VB is like totally already enabled on the safe. <laughs> so this is the door opening. Those are the uh, canisters that have uh, hold the money. <laughs> That's it. So that was the, the main exploit chain that we used. Um, there were other things that we identified while looking through uh, the system. So um, passwords were stored, hashed in the database with another column immediately beside it with the plain text credentials. Yeah. <laughs> that was a really. I, I just have this mental picture in my head of like the developers writing a safe uh, software, right? And they like have plain text passwords in the database, and the manager comes by and says like, "You can't do that. That's insecure." And so they like, "All right," like hit new column, add hashed passwords, and just like calls it a day. Like fix that problem. Hashed passwords done. <laughs> Um, but again, that winds up not being terribly relevant to like our exploit chain, like to get access to it, because all the credentials that are in there that you would steal are like um, the store manager accounts and uh, like cashier accounts that don't have access to where the cache is. Yeah, the, so armored, the, car, not being the armored car guys don't have credentials stored in these da databases. They use their their authentication yeah. keys. So that magnetic you would only have memory. access to manager accounts or something yeah. like that, which wouldn't open the safe. Um, so also it kind of turns out you don't need a mouse. You can perform all the actions as a touch screen after all. Uh, but right click is essentially just a click and hold, which is I think just a feature of the touch display yeah. and not so much feature uh, of the software itself. So if you really wanted to, you could do the whole thing right from the touch screen. Just like go to the flash video and hold and press and then like pull up an on-screen keyboard. It would be horrible, right? And we didn't actually ever bother to go through that chain because it would take like a day or something. I can imagine trying to automate that by like putting some device like on top of the safe that like press the buttons for you. It would be horrible. It would be horrible. The, the USB port is basically just like there to help streamline the entire exploit. Yeah. Um, and so I think Dan touched on this a little bit earlier, but the the way that the safe operates is there is essentially a, a COM port that, that sends the open door command to you know the solenoids or whatever that connects to the safe doors. Mm -hmm. So if you were to kind of use that instead, right, you could have just as easily have hooked into the DLL and issued the open door command. There's literally a DLL with an open door as a function. We're like, we didn't even bother with it, didn't need to as it turned out. Like the, the way that we exploited it was just by like adding an account and logging in and using the application, right? But of course one could simply just like send direct COM port traffic to that, like implement your own COM driver. That would be a lot like cleaner perhaps as an exploit, but we just didn't need to. So that sounded hard and we didn't feel like doing hard things. All right, so um, I guess we kind of touched it a little bit earlier as well. The Internet of Things is is happening, right? There's smart devices that are uh, or devices that typically haven't been connected to the Internet that are in this rush to become smart, uh, get connected to the network, get connected to your home, give you feedback. Um, the idea, I think, is just we got to make this work as soon as possible. Everyone's doing this. We got to get this out. Before anybody else does. And to be perfectly fair, though, I mean that's the state of most like 
I mean, large software developing uh, houses, right? They're just barely struggling to get things to work, let alone getting them to work well, and let alone getting them to fail well. So, like, um, as like this moves forward to you know everyday household or business devices, like this is only going to be something we see more of. Yeah, and, and a lot of it's hardware companies moving into the space yeah. of software, right? This typically have been working on you know, these safes that have been around for centuries, or they've been working on these around mm -hmm. cars or a light bulb or a toaster or whatever. They've never had to have a development team and a security team. Um, and so as that starts to happen more and more, uh, I think that we'll yeah. be seeing a lot of more. I, uh, more I think it's really things. easy to be flippant about it, right, and be like, come on, do we really need a smart safe? Like, the old mechanical ones are doing just fine. But, like, uh, that's kind of being a prude about it, right? Like, this is going to happen. This is the future, whether you like it or not, right? And so we as security people can either help or not. Like, these sort of smart uh, uh, devices were, in a way, the, like, the promise that we as technology people made to the rest of the world that we said all this technology was going to transform, like, households and devices in the world. And, like, this is partly what that means, right? So, like, let's not try to shut that down. Instead, try to, you know, help these devices out as we uh, go forward into that world. And I think that's, uh, that's everything. That's about it. Thanks. <laughs>I am told that we have a, a microphone that we're going to do for questions, so I don't know where that is. I expect to see a goon like frantically running around with a microphone at any moment now. Um, uh, until that point, maybe I could just like repeat a question. I saw at least a hand here, and I could like repeat it to the crowd. Oh, the crowd. USB Autorun, try it. Oh, auto run. Oh, auto yeah. run. Yeah. So um, uh, there's a difference between auto run and auto play, as it turns out. Um, so the, the question was about um, USB auto run, right? So if you plug in like a USB device, like uh, it will come up with a prompt that's auto play that'll say, "What would you like to do with this device?" It doesn't do auto run, which is the like run the first executable you see on this like CD. Um, that would be like really easy, and that was the first thing we tried. Um, but uh, no, that did not work, unfortunately. So also the pop up when it says like what executable would you like to run on here? Um, that comes up behind the application, right? So you still need a way to exit out of the full screen application in order for that to happen. Oh, it looks like we have a microphone finally. So it's in the front here if you're looking to ask a question. Hello, my name is Fred Smith, and um, I was wondering if you had a uh, written, uh, everything that you talked about uh, in a written format or online that I could access. Uh, uh, if you like this entire presentation, uh, is it written down somewhere that I could access? The, um, oh, the content of the presentation? Yes. Um, I, yeah, I think that they've been writing it out over there. I don't yeah. know. Uh, I'm sure it'll be available on the DEF CON right. website. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I hope so. So you mentioned the USB port on the back. Yeah. That you said was hard to access because of the physical access. Did you ever actually try your TNC board on that port to see if it would work? Yeah, that one works as well. In fact, the back, the, the rear USB port seems to be powered a bit more. Like if I have a, a regular USB device, like a, a mouse or keyboard, that works fine in the front port. If you try giving it like an entire um, USB hard drive that like sucks out a little bit more power, it, the front port just doesn't work. Like I think it just the back one has more power, but they're otherwise completely hooked up. And did you ever connect the to the network ports to see what those do? Or no, we never hooked it up to the network. Yeah, well, at least the one that uh, we have uh, sitting around the office. Uh, we saw a talk yesterday where uh, they used a twin duck, a rubber ducky with twin du in twin duck mode, so you could do mass storage and uh, keyboard stuff. So basically, like you just stick it in the laptop and basically set up a new. Uh, wireless access profile and all this crazy stuff to basically pull in the machine. So, you think that would have worked as well for this, where it would even having to get past the kiosk mode? Yes. So, yeah. um, once you bypass the kiosk, you're running as administrator. So, you could easily think of a scenario where instead of having it just immediately open the safe, uh, you upload a piece of software that will, let's say, open the door later or run uh, any configuration yeah. files that you want. Yeah, for our purposes, we just wanted to demonstrate opening the door, so that was like the first thing that we did. Yeah. Thanks. First of all, thanks for an excellent presentation. That looked like it was a lot of fun to tinker with. Did you, uh, you mentioned that it's a Brink safe, and you mentioned another company along the way, Fire, somebody rather, I didn't catch the name of, that uh, worked around and closed the exploit you used, the exploit chain, if you will, by breaking Internet Explorer. Uh, it's, you demonstrated or at least alluded to several other avenues by which you could compromise this ridiculously poorly designed safe. Mm -hmm. uh, 
did they attempt to address the rest of this sort of obvious low-hanging fruit there? Are we going to see you next year doing this talk again about how you loaded the DLL and called the appropriate yeah. unlock? You're definitely not going to see us next year. At least not hit this. Maybe something else. <laughs> next um, week. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, uh, um, yeah, we worked with uh, the, the vendors involved to try to get um, uh, you know, a fix for that um, exact exploit chain. Um, and, yeah. we'll, and they've we'll been informed with. of the other things, and they're working yeah. on, on addressing yeah. those as well. Okay, so you made them aware. It's on, the, on their to-do list somewhere, right. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Hi. Um, you had mentioned the possibility of like, replay attacks over just the COM port to the actual safe. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys look at that protocol and say, like, is it the same command to all of the safes? Is there an actual key for each one? Or if you break there's, it for one, do you break all of them? There's ostensibly, we didn't like, uh, so we tried looking at the COM port traffic just a little bit. And I was kind of crossing my fingers and hoping there'd be like a four byte message that would just be like unlock. And it was not that easy. It was like back and forth protocol. And I'm like, ah, this okay. is just hard. And I'm not even going to look into it, basically. Um, yeah, the COM port communications ends up being like, there's like a, a ping and, and like yeah. a response and like a, it's like on a timer, and there's a bunch of like variables as well. So it, yeah. it's definitely something that presumably could be done, but we didn't really look into it. Thanks. Yeah, pr presumably there's not a key involved there, or if there is, they're the same. Or we don't really know, I guess. Thanks. I wasn't sure if I heard it correctly. It sounded like in the beginning you mentioned something about this thing having uh, full-time network connectivity and normal operation like cell mm -hmm. data, anything like that, or just hardwire? It's just hardwire. So it's, it's meant to talk back to the bank, right? So it knows how much money you have at okay. any given time. So as you deposit money into it, that money gets deposited into your bank account. Uh, and because of that, it's, just, it's always connected. Yeah. Was there any evidence of support for other network methods like uh, you know cell, uh, cell uh, modems, that sort of thing? No, I don't think no. there's cell phone. There was a, a, like a phone jack for like old dial-up, I think, as yeah. well, if you had that in your store. But yeah. uh, I, I didn't see any evidence of any yeah. cell phone or I, other kind of A wireless. lot of point-of-sale systems still run off of phone jacks, basically. So that has that option, but primarily it's Ethernet. Did you, did you get the impression that, the, that if the network connection was in place, it would have reported your actions as you were functioning? Uh, logs and such are definitely sent out over the network, right? Um, so that it could hypothetically, but if you have complete control over the operating system, then you could just modify that to you know not report your um, like opening the safe or not report opening the door. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're running as administrator. Once you break out of the kiosk mode, that wouldn't that wouldn't be logged, right? Um, and you could shut down the network while you worked on whatever you wanted to, and then plug it back in afterwards if you wanted to. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, did the vendor, it seems like the USB port facilitated everything. Did the vendor say there was a business need for that USB port on the front? Was yeah, there, there's like, definitely something to be said about like usability versus security in that uh, respect, right? Because it's, it's useful, right? Especially if you're a service technician, being able to like have a mouse and keyboard present there, right? Um, and so uh, there's also like something that's come up a bunch is like, well, what happens if the hard drive just crashes? Right? Or like what happens if the computer just melts down and now you're just like locked out of your safe? Um, and so having like an external like device that you could like reboot into the BIOS or whatever, like that's handy, right? You can you can um, then recover from that situation. Um, so you kind of have a trade-off between security and usability there, right? Um, do you want to have a safe that like fails open in this sense, right? Like if the hard drive fails, then you can still open it anyway, or do you want to have a safe that fails closed? Um, and that's kind of a business decision to be made. Thank you. Thanks. Since the uh, it per gives provisional credit to the financial institution, do you could you see customer information, like account numbers? I'm sorry, or I, didn't, I, I didn't hear that. When you when the they put the money in the safe, it gives the provisional credit transmits right. to the to the uh, to the bank. Yeah. Could you see account numbers? Account numbers? I it, I don't remember. the customer account number. No, uh, we didn't uh, look too much into the actual mechanism of like how it like specifically sends your money, um, like. It very well could just be some web service that says like deposit this money into this account, and if you like change the account, then like bad thing. No idea. That's all just pure speculation, basically. Um, I would as I would assume that it would have something baked into there, like we would know what account you are. It, I mean, it has to know what account you are. What it, what was the fix offered by the vendor? Uh, so they essentially broke the attack chain by preventing Internet Explorer from opening, so uh, kind of blacklist Internet Explorer. So yeah. uh, going to like flash and right clicking and go to an about configuration wouldn't um, load up that portion and we wouldn't be able to uh, escape out that way. 
but would you still be able to do something with a USB drive in that case, or does that completely block it? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, the, the same attacks where you would plug in a USB and like boot from it and do that kind of attack would still be possible. But the, you'd have to figure out how to reverse engineer the software first, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You could just reboot it with the red button, right? I'm sorry? You could just reboot it with the red button, right? Yeah, yeah you can reboot the yeah. device, yes. Yeah. You do need physical access, right, to plug yeah, but then you. So that's true, you need physical access to basically do the entire hack, but at the same time you need physical access to actually carry away the cache. So like, that's kind of required anyway. Um, no, but so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, if you can plug in the USB, you can also click that red button, right? Yeah, so exactly. You that, that's correct. Yeah. Internet yeah. Explorer so, I mean, there are other fixes um, that would be able to help against, um, like, a boot from USB attack, like trying to put a password on a BIOS, right, to, like, lock down the BIOS so you can't boot from USB, maybe encrypting the file system, um, a whole number of things, right? Yeah, um, a lot of those kind of, again, play into the usability yeah. um, of the safe, right? If everybody has to boot into BIOS and plug in a keyboard and yeah. type in the password and do all that stuff, that might yeah. not be. Uh, a reasonable solution. And as they're essentially embedded devices, it's not necessarily easy to um, update the software as well. Thank you. Especially Thank you. at the BIOS level. Um, do I see... Any other questions? Yeah. Hey. So, if you have like the USB drive that can act as a keyboard or a mouse or whatever, mm -hmm. why do you actually need to like open Internet Explorer? Why can't you like just send commands as a keyboard? And do do it in the background without any visible. So there are some things that are already like locked down, right? So if you try to hit like Alt Tab, like that just doesn't work. That's like in the Windows registry, like been disabled as a keyboard. So like going to Internet Explorer is basically a way of escaping out of the, the kiosk sandbox um, of the application because their application is just a regular Windows program running in full screen mode. So there's no way to like run arbitrary commands just because you know, there's no button to press to get there, right? So the first step in being able to run arbitrary commands is escaping out of that sandbox, like pulling up well Internet Explorer, which then runs regular. Explorer, which then runs a command prompt. Um, so, that's yeah, basically so if you were to like try to type commands, the, the application itself would register all your typing, and so you wouldn't be running it. You can't run anything yeah. in the background. Uh, if you like, you can use the keyboard to like type in your username and password. Uh, as a, if you were to plug in the keyboard, that's how you could log in as well. So it, it, I, I yeah. assume you can you can do like the run run command to execute. Right, you can't yeah. press the Windows button. The Windows button is disabled as well, so you can't yeah. just hit the run command. Yeah. Thank you. Do you guys have any plans on researching how uh, the money gets deposited in the bank and what, what kind of issues can happen with the I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time? Do you guys have any plans on researching on how the money or the cash gets uh, yeah, deposited get back to you. Oh, how the like, actual okay. bank I mean, like, through the network and yeah. what? I, I don't know if we're going to be doing too much additional research on that. I, you know, I think we'll probably be moving on to something else uh, pretty soon, but we're still working with the vendors uh, to address the rest of the issues. Okay. Because um, with, with stealing the cash, there's only this much cash you can steal, but if you can like replay and keep adding money to the account. Um, right. So are you saying like if you were, were to essentially fal falsify how much money was in right. the account? Right. Right. Um, yeah, since you have access as the administrator, you have access. Like, if you're able to essentially get access to the operating system, uh, the security of the of the safe itself um, is at that point compromised. So the the security is based on keeping you in the kiosk mode. Um, and so yeah. Right. So if the hard drive isn't encrypted and you can boot from USB, couldn't you just like boot to a live CD and then edit the registry to break out of the sandbox? Yeah, you can absolutely just boot from Linux. Yeah. Um, like that, that something that is pretty straightforward. We, we like thought really hard about maybe making like a Minecraft server that would run on the safe or something like that. But a guy just the, 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 the specs on it are just quite good enough. Certainly not a client, maybe a server. Um, but yeah, you can um, you can run arbitrary software like boot from uh, another device and run a non-Windows operating system, right? And then maybe even if the the, the hard drive are encrypted, just 
clobber the hard drive with an entirely new image, right? So that's why, in addition to like things like full disk encryption, you would also want something like um, like BIOS level like um, password um, like on the BIOS, right? And that point, it would actually usually BIOS level like BIOS passwords are kind of chuckled at because you just like remove the CMOS battery or something like that. Uh, but, but in this, this point, situation, in yeah. this situation, the computer is inside the safe, right? So you can't just do that. So it would actually be a reasonable um, defense. All right, cool, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, considering the, the, the whole complicated solution the, the safe the manufacturer did just blocking the flare and all that thing, wasn't it simple just to place all the, all the inerts just behind lock and key and that's it? Why just leave the, the board exposed and not just lock it in? Yeah, um, so it, again, it kind of just boils down to usability, it seems like. Um, having access to an exposed USB port makes it easy for a technician to come in and do their work, but they could have just as easily had the technician, you know, remove the front panel and plug into the back USB or, or do something else. Yeah. Or you give them just a, a key to each technician and that's it. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, real quick, I'm hoping you, you sort of thought this out in the fantasy world. What, what would be like your, your fantasy real world heist involving this capability and then, and then what if anything can you extrapolate to other smart safes from? I, I think that we want to emphasize that you know, like we, we're not trying to um, like enable theft, right? Like we're, we're providing the information like for um, pen testers um, that like if you're a pen tester and you have one of these safes, right? I think it'd be abundantly clear um, like how to reproduce um, our findings um, to be able to like um, do this um, on your own. Um, but uh, like you know, going through some actual like theft scenario isn't you know something we really want to encourage. Okay, looks like we're out of time, so thanks a lot. All right, thanks everyone.